Hey everyone, today we're diving into another spine-chilling case. Fear that unsettling and negative emotion is something most people try to avoid. But Cassandra and her twin brother Rob were different. As kids, they couldn't go a day without sharing terrifying stories in a dark room. Rob fancied himself a natural storyteller, although Cassandra would scream at every tale he spun. Pretending to be brave, Rob would tease her, saying, you can't even scare the neighbor's little Joey with stories like that. Clearly, scary stories weren't his forte. They also bonded over their love for watching the animated series, Scooby-Doo. As they watched, they would argue about which character in the story would turn out to be a ghost or a vampire in disguise. Cassandra's intuitive guesses often proved to be ahead of her brothers, making him a bit nervous. Their mother, Mary Smith, didn't share their passion, but she wanted to instill a love of reading in her children, so she bought them books by Robert Wall. Their fascination with scary stories wasn't just a childhood hobby. It became a lifelong passion for both siblings. They even started collecting figurines of villains and, as adults, considered opening a themed store dedicated to the horror culture. Cassandra's love for horror movies even led her to work on a movie set in 2004. Cassandra's luck landed her a cameo in a not-so-popular horror movie, which triggered a wave of envy in Rob. He began pleading with his sister to help him secure a role. You must have made some connections there, right? I'm up for any part. Let's talk, CAS, Rob insisted, hoping Cassandra had some influence with the casting director. Cassandra, however, had to break the news that she had stumbled upon the opportunity herself and couldn't guarantee anything. I got the part by accident, so I can't make any promises, she replied. Rob was disappointed, but he couldn't land even an episodic role. The casting director of that movie, Colin Dudley, had a spark with the budding actress on set. However, neither of them mustered the courage to take the first step. Their dynamics changed during a corporate Halloween party. Cassandra dressed up as Velma from Scooby-Doo, while Colin chose to portray Alex from A Clockwork Orange. For Cassandra, it was just a costume, but for Colin, it seemed to hold a deeper meaning. Throughout the evening, Colin walked around with a glass of milk, giving everyone the same menacing glare his character had in the movie. He also recited quotes from the book, including one that caught Cassandra's attention. With a glimmer in his eyes, he said, Beauty invariably caused my only desire to destroy it, for it did not fit at all into our ugly world. Cassandra took it as a compliment, and soon after, they began dating. However, their relationship was short-lived. Colin quickly moved on to another actress, Rebecca, and they started dating. Eventually, they even moved in together. Then, on August 25, 2020, Cassandra Cantrell vanished without a trace. She left home in her car without notifying anyone of her plans and stopped answering phone calls. When her worried mother reported her disappearance to the police, they were initially hesitant, trying to calm her down by suggesting that sometimes children grow up and forget to inform their parents when they go out with friends. Mary Smith was convinced that something terrible had happened to her daughter. If only the sluggish police would start taking action, she might still have hope of finding Cassandra alive. However, the search for Cassandra didn't begin until two days later, and on the third day, the police discovered her car under a bridge in a less than desirable area. Adding to the distressing news, the car was unlocked, and the keys were inside. It was baffling to understand why Cassandra would be in this neighborhood known for its homeless population. The area was notorious for domestic disputes and drug-related deaths among its residents. The officers had to comb through the neighborhood, questioning numerous homeless individuals who attempted to evade the police upon their arrival. Unfortunately, their efforts yielded no results. None of the residents had seen Cassandra, nor did they know when her car appeared there. Given the circumstances of the neighborhood, it wasn't surprising that the inhabitants, who spent their days drinking alcohol, couldn't provide any useful information. The detective leading the search for Cassandra followed protocol and requested her cell phone billing records. However, he held little hope that it would lead to any breakthroughs based on past experiences. True to his expectations, the signal indicated that the phone was submerged in the nearest body of water to the bridge, rendering any chance of retrieval and gathering crucial information impossible. Nonetheless, a team of divers began searching the coastal area. 
Before doing so, they stood on the shore and threw rocks into the water to gauge the distance they could potentially throw the phone. Cassandra's mother mentioned that her daughter's phone case was adorned with rhinestones, making it easier to locate. Indeed, the phone was soon recovered, but Cassandra's body was not found in the water. While this news was presented to her mother as a positive development, the poor woman didn't feel any relief. She had grown accustomed to the idea that her daughter was no longer alive and only wished for closure by finding her body, bringing an end to this agonizing uncertainty. I was looking forward to my granddaughter. I wanted to become a grandmother soon, and I hadn't even had the chance to prepare a crib. It's just sitting in the garage unused. What should I do with it now? Mary expressed her sorrow. Unbeknownst to her, this became significant information for the investigation. Statistics showed a high percentage of crimes against pregnant women were committed by their partners, the fathers-to-be. However, Mary didn't know who the potential father of her future granddaughter was. As far as she knew, Cassandra, despite being of a certain age, wasn't married and hadn't mentioned anyone in her life. It was understandable that she had become pregnant by a man, but Mary had no information about the potential father. According to her mother, Cassandra frequently corresponded and spoke with someone over the phone. However, for some reason, the phone number of this person wasn't recorded in Cassandra's address book, and Mary couldn't recall the number herself. She found it peculiar that Cassandra would communicate so frequently with someone without saving their number. Typically, girls couldn't keep their relationships a complete secret, and Cassandra should have confided in at least one friend who might hold the key to her secrets. Especially when those secrets revolved around pregnancy, having a friend who knew about them was crucial. And fortunately, such a friend was found. During a conversation with the police, she revealed that Cassandra had reconnected with her former boyfriend, Colin Dudley. Yes, their previous relationship in 24 had been short-lived, and it had been 15 years since they broke up. It was quite surprising that after so much time, they remembered each other. It turned out that Colin had reached out to Cassandra himself. They had worked together on a movie set, and in 2014 he found her on Facebook. He wrote some warm words and confessed that he had recently lost his father, with whom his wife Rebecca had a difficult relationship. With no one else to share his grief with, Colin sought solace in Cassandra. Purely out of friendly motives, Cassandra agreed to meet and talk with her ex-boyfriend to offer him comfort. However, the friendly meeting soon evolved into something more. Since 2014, Colin had been leading a double life, maintaining relationships with both Cassandra and his wife. Cassandra found herself in the role of his mistress. When Cassandra discovered that she was pregnant, she made the difficult decision not to inform Colin Dudley. Every time she considered telling him, she remembered their conversation where he strongly expressed his aversion to having children and his happiness about Rebecca's infertility. The news of a potential daughter or son could potentially destroy Colin's family, and Cassandra didn't want to hurt her lover, so she chose to keep the pregnancy a secret. Meanwhile, her belly continued to grow, making it impossible to hide under oversized sweaters. In an attempt to avoid suspicion, Cassandra stopped seeing Colin altogether. However, she couldn't hide the truth for long, and she knew that lying about having another boyfriend would only cause pain and potentially lead to a breakup. Ultimately, Cassandra decided that honesty was the best approach. She mustered the courage to inform Colin over the phone that she was expecting their child. There was a moment of silence before Colin finally expressed his delight upon hearing the news. It sounded strange to Cassandra, but she concluded that Colin was genuinely pleased. The detective arrived at Colin's house and knocked on the door. Colin's wife answered, and realizing that it wouldn't be ethical to discuss a missing mistress in her presence, the detective introduced himself as an old friend of Dudley's. Colin emerged from the house and closed the door behind him, immediately walking away with the detective, even before proper introductions were made. It was as if Colin had been anticipating this meeting. Thank you for not revealing your credentials in front of Rebecca. You're a man of honor, a true officer. My compliments to you. Colin spoke in short sentences. He acknowledged that he had heard about Cassandra's disappearance, finding it strange and baffling. He couldn't even begin to guess where she might have gone. Colin shared that Cassandra had mentioned having a major fight with her brother and expressed deep worry about it. 
He had advised her to reconcile with him, but he wasn't sure if she had taken his advice. The detective already knew about the fight between Cassandra and Rob, as Rob himself had informed him. It was merely a family misunderstanding, but Cassandra's twin brother had been greatly upset by it. On the day she disappeared, Cassandra had called him, expressing a desire to talk and make amends. However, fueled by pride, Rob had refused, and now he blamed himself for it. If only his sister had visited him that day, she wouldn't have vanished. Officer, I'm not the best person, as you can tell. Keeping a secret relationship with my ex-girlfriend while being married, I'm sure I'll face consequences for it in the afterlife. But the heart doesn't choose who it loves. Back in 2014, my father passed away. He truly despised Rebecca, and the feeling was mutual. However, he held Cassandra in high regard. He often brought her up, criticizing me for ending things with her shortly after Christmas. We often clash with our parents, accusing them of not understanding, only to realize that it's us, their children, who don't understand. It's painful. My father was right, of course. After he passed, I wanted to fulfill one of his wishes, so I rekindled my relationship with Cassandra. Breaking up with Rebecca was a conversation I kept postponing. Family matters drain you, and I kept procrastinating. I lived a double life for five years. It was torturous. I had to invent reasons for coming home late all the time. To cover my tracks, I'd fabricate business trips and even bought a fishing rod, despite hating fishing. It was a ridiculous pastime, but I'd tell Rebecca I was going to the lake while I visited Cassandra. Before returning home, I'd purchase fish from the supermarket for added credibility, and Rebecca would bake it in the oven, although the smell of fish nauseates me. Did you know Cassandra was pregnant? Pregnant? By whom? Colin questioned, stunned. I don't have that information, but she confided in a close friend that it was from you. That can't be true. Lately, she's been refusing to see me, and I guess I understand her. She was tired of being in the shadows and yearned for a family, which, unfortunately, I couldn't provide. I suppose the reason she declined to see me was because she had found someone else. When was the last time you saw her? inquired Detective Colin. To be honest, I can't recall. It was about three months ago, maybe four, if you don't count the brief encounter at the mall. My wife was in the fitting room and I grew tired of waiting for her, so I went for a walk to the coffee shop, Colin recollected. Is there any chance you'll find her alive? Dudley asked, seeking reassurance. We're doing everything we can. Trust me, the detective assured him. This wouldn't be Colin's final interaction with the detective. Although Cassandra's phone couldn't be recovered from the pond, the police obtained the call details of the missing person and discovered that the unidentified number mentioned by her mother likely belonged to Colin Dudley. Most of Cassandra's calls were to him, including the day of her disappearance. Additionally, CCTV footage from the train station near the bridge, where Cassandra's abandoned car was found, revealed a peculiar figure. A man in a long cloak, gloves, a scarf covering his face, and a hat obscuring his eyes stood out among the crowd of passengers on the platform. The man's gait strongly resembled that of Colin Dudley, and the hat bore a striking resemblance to the one worn by Alex from A Clockwork Orange. After tracking the mysterious man's movements through the CCTV cameras, the detectives observed him briefly entering a cafe before heading to the parking lot and driving away in his car. Despite never revealing his face, they managed to capture the license plate number of the car, which belonged to Colin Dudley. A unit was dispatched to his residence with a search warrant, hoping to find Cassandra alive in the basement. Initially, there was no evidence of a crime at Colin's house, but a significant discovery was made in the closet, the very hat Colin had used to conceal himself. Despite searching the basement, Cassandra was not found, and no evidence of a crime was uncovered. However, a specially trained service dog, adept at detecting the scent of blood, exhibited a concerning reaction when it sniffed the couch. Colin vehemently maintained his innocence, claiming that the police had no evidence and were attempting to falsely accuse an innocent man. The detective interviewed his wife, who was understandably shocked by the accusations against her husband and the revelation of years of deceit. When asked whether her husband was capable of murder, she hesitated before responding in the negative. Despite the evidence found against Colin, it wasn't sufficient to warrant his arrest, 
leaving Rob and Mary Smith, as well as the detective, frustrated. Colin was summoned for further questioning and provided an alibi for the allegations. At 6.30 a.m., on August 25th, he had visited a hardware store, purchasing household cleaning chemicals and trash bags confirmed by the store's surveillance footage. However, the large trash bags raised suspicions. Following the store visit, Colin received a text message from Cassandra indicating her imminent arrival at his house. He promptly deleted the message, but it remained in the cell phone carrier's records, which the police accessed. Additionally, their cell phone billing revealed that the couple did not leave the house for several hours that morning. Colin then powered off his phone, but inadvertently left his mistress's phone on, allowing the police to track his movements, including his stop at the train station's CCTV cameras after the cafe, presumably to clean up. Subsequently, Colin drove to the pond where he disposed of Cassandra's phone, as indicated by the last signal received from the device. The next step was to search for Cassandra's body. To accurately trace his route, the police seized a GPS tracker from Colin's car. The device mirrored the movements of Cassandra's cell phone signal, providing new evidence based on his actions the following day. The authorities retraced his path through the woods and discovered a large trash can tied with ropes in a ravine, marking a significant development in the case. The area surrounding the container was saturated with blood, leaving no doubt about its contents. A month had passed since the murder, making the identification of the body challenging. However, Cassandra's distinctive tattoo, detailed in the search notes, aided the police in confirming her identity. Colin was apprehended on the same day and charged with murder. Forensic analysis revealed that the cause of death was a fractured skull resulting from blunt force trauma. Traces of blood were discovered in the Dudley House's basement, indicating an attempt to conceal the crime scene that proved unsuccessful. Rebecca, unaware of the murder, had spent the entire day in another part of the house, oblivious to any activity in the basement. She confirmed that Colin's claims about her infertility were fabrications, leading the police to consider this as a motive for the crime. During the trial, the lack of witnesses and physical evidence, such as the murder weapon, made it impossible to convince the jury of Colin Dudley's guilt. Subsequently, the court offered a plea deal, proposing a reduced sentence in exchange for a guilty plea. Colin accepted the deal and was sentenced to 26 years in prison. Cassandra's mother and her remorseful brother, who regretted not meeting with his sister before her death, were deeply upset by the outcome knowing that the perpetrator would likely live to see the day when he could be released from prison. The tragic story of Cassandra's murder and the mysterious killer known as the Hat Man serves as a grim reminder of the dangers that lurk in the digital world. It teaches us the importance of being vigilant and cautious when interacting with strangers online. This chilling incident highlights the need to prioritize our safety, to be wary of sharing personal information, and to exercise caution when meeting individuals we encounter on the internet. Ultimately, the moral lesson we can glean from this harrowing tale is to always prioritize our well-being and to never underestimate the potential risks that may arise from our digital interactions.